you all for coming. Uh, I'm just going to give you a brief welcome uh, in front of the Department of Media Studies and Film at the New School. And we're uh, extremely glad to do this event together with the Tribeca Film Institute. Uh, this is, I think, our fourth, fourth or fifth event. And they've been extremely um, gracious with all of them and have been a great success so far. Uh, so without further ado, I want to introduce Eileen Newman, who is the director of the Termeca Film Institute, and she will introduce the panelists. Thanks. Hi, welcome everybody. Um, this has really been a, a sort of, I was saying to Vlad and some of the panelists, sort of this underground series that Vlad and I have been putting together with a lot of help from our friends. Um, and what we've done is really looked at topics that we thought would be of interest to the general public, to film students around media and film. Um, we've done a few of them a year and brought in experts who are also very accessible. Um, there are three people from, Tri or two people actually from Tribeca here um, tonight, Ryan Harrington and Tamir Mohammed. Um, we have, Tribeca has other funding initiatives than the ones you'll hear about from them. Um, there are postcards out on the uh, limited editions, of, out on the piano. Um, the one I would just mention is um, Sloan. We get money from the Sloan Foundation that we re-grant to filmmakers who have, um, it's for finishing funds for projects that are around science and narrative films. So um, we take films actually at any, um, at any point in their development, but we are hoping to get these films out and seen. So that would just be the one program that we have. We probably won't be talking about tonight. And um, I have to say, when 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 Vlad and I kind of come up with these ideas of what these panels will be of interest. I turn around, I leave my office, and I go to Ingrid Kopp, who's, who um, has space in our office. We're very happy to have her there. Um, and Ingrid is with shooting people and knows the new and old world of media at large and has great people who she's introduced us to and she's a wonderful moderator. So um, they're going to sit down there, um, I think, more comfortably. And I'm going to have Ingrid introduce the rest of this terrific panel. So enjoy. Hi, everyone. So I guess you can all hear me through these microphones here, right? Yeah, cool. Um, so yeah, I'm Ingrid Kopp. Um, I run Shooting People, which is a, a network for independent filmmakers. We basically connect filmmakers with each other and with resources that they need. So uh, check it out. It's uh, shootingpeople.org. Um, we also have monthly meetup groups. Um, so you can come and have a drink and talk about film and meet people to collaborate with. Um, and um, one other resource that I just wanted to mention now, because I know I'll forget otherwise, is um, I've created a, a wiki where every time I do a panel like this and I find out about new amazing organizations or new resources that are useful for filmmakers, I just throw them up on the wiki and it's open so you guys can throw your resources up there too. Um, and it's digitalbootcamp.wikispaces.org. So um, uh, check it out because I've got a lot of the funding uh, bodies on there along with fiscal sponsors and lots of other resources that you might need and it's all categorized and you can go in there and you know, add, add your own suggestions as well, so, so check that out. Um, I'm actually going to let you guys introduce yourselves, I think, since you know yourselves better than I know you. Um, and so let's start with Yancy, and then we'll just go down the line. How's it going? I'm um, Yancy Strickler. I'm one of the founders of Kickstarter, which is a site that helps people raise money for creative projects. Hi, my name is uh, Tamir Mohammed. I'm director of Trebekah All Access, which is a grant and support um, program for emerging and narrative filmmakers with great projects and have at least one writer or director attached that has a filmmaker who comes from a traditionally underrepresented community. Hi, I'm Adela Lajavardi. I'm the grants manager at Cinereach, and Cinereach is a film production and funding organization, nonprofit based in New York, and uh, we fund vital stories artfully told. We've been told to pick up our mics. 
<laughs> and with that, I'm Ryan Harrington. I'm the director of documentary programs at the Tribeca Film Institute. I oversee uh, two of our documentary funds, uh, the Gucci Tribeca Documentary Fund, which is um, aimed towards character, story-driven social issue documentaries, and also the Tribeca Film Institute Documentary Fund, which is for the opposite, for um, engaging character-driven films without a um, advocacy or social issue message. Um, so just to get a sense of who you guys are, how many of you are currently making films? So most of you are filmmakers. And how many of you are making documentaries? And how many of you are making narratives? Cool. Okay, so you, there's a good good mix. Um, so we're going to talk. I mean, obviously, we're representing a, a mix across the panel. Um, Ryan's pretty strictly doc. Um, Cinerito mix. Yep. Uh, or Tribeca All Access is a mix. Mix. And Kickstarter is a mix. There you go. You're in luck. Just 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 Ryan at the end. Great. This is going to be fun for me. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we'll we'll touch a little bit on um, on both doc and and narrative funding and, and the differences therein. Um, one of the things I guess I just wanted to do uh, first off, since I know you may not be um, totally familiar with how these particular funds work, is just. Uh, to, I guess start with Ryan and just talk a little bit about how your funding cycles work, how much money you give, and um, and how many projects you give that money to. Sure. Um, well, I should just say for all of the Tribeca Film Institute um, granting, um, we we all have the same start and and end date. So so Tamir and I have just opened our submissions last week and we'll close on December eighth. Like Eileen said, our postcards are right on the table. Um, through the uh, Gucci Fund, I fund four to ten projects a year with grants of ten to twenty five thousand uh, dollars. We're looking for films that are in production or post production. Um, those uh, can be anywhere in the production stage as long as you have enough footage to kind of give us to show us. Uh, sense of character and story and, and where the story is actually going. With the TFI Doc Fund, uh, we fund um, we have three fellowships um, with HBO, um, where we are giving fifty thousand dollars, twenty five thousand dollars, and twenty five thousand dollars, and then uh, outside of that, five grants of ten thousand um, dollars to a, a different array of films, anywhere from um, development or advanced stages of development to post production. And Adela? Okay, yeah. Um, so CineReach has two funding cycles a year. We call them our summer and winter cycle, and we're just finishing up our summer cycle. And the winter cycle will be, uh, the deadline will be December 1st. We have $250,000 that we give away for each cycle. Um, we fund both fiction and nonfiction feature length films um, from all stages, research and development through post production. We do not fund research and, uh, sorry, distribution and outreach. Um, the grants range from five dollars to $50,000 per project. And and with each cycle, it's between 10 to 15 projects. And uh, Tribeca All Access, we're making some changes um, to the program. This year, we are going to um, accept less pro projects. But the reason that is is because we have, over the years, have supported a lot of filmmakers that we want to continue to support the projects they are working on and new. So that being said, just as Ryan mentioned, we have our open submissions. We're going to uh, take less projects so that we can give more. That being said, we're going to take five docs and five narratives. Um, each of the projects is going to automatically get $10,000 um, before participating in the program and then be eligible for another $10,000, which is a jury prize during the Tribeca Film Festival that we will present it to. Um, so, um, of course, we'll talk a little bit later about what we actually do at the festival uh, for our projects, but that's basically where our um, funding cycle works. Yeah, I'm d I definitely uh, want us to touch a lot on uh, on how you actually add mentorship and, and other support to the funding so that it's not just about ca the cash, um, and also about, obviously, um, there is only so many projects that are actually getting funded, so how filmmakers can find resources beyond beyond the funding. So we'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, but before I get to Yancy, I just wanted to say that it, I think it's really cool that we are having you know new funding models um, coming up. Uh, I don't know if any of you were at the IFP um, Independent Filmmakers Conference this week, but there was a panel um, on changing funding models, and Deborah Zimmerman, who runs uh, Women Make Movies, was talking about how you know. Funding, uh, funding has always been in flux. There's always been funding coming from different places, and it's always changed. And and that we, as a documentary community, you know, often need to make those changes, um, and to make sure that we are getting the support that we need for the films that we want to make, uh, which is obviously easier said than done. Um, but 
Kickstarter is, I think, an incredible um, resource in terms of actually putting the power back in the hands of the creative. So do you want to talk a little bit about how that actually works? Uh, sure. Well, so Kickstarter is a website where basically um, anyone can put up a creative project or something they want to do. You say how much money you need to do it. You say what people get in exchange. So if you're making a film, you could say for 10 bucks you download the movie. For 25, you get the DVD. For 500, I'll mail you a prop or you know whatever it is that you want to do. Um, and then people raise money from their audiences and from the rest of the internet. And uh, in terms of the kind of numbers, you know we've been uh, live for almost a year and a half, and we're close to 20 million dollars has come into the site. We've had about eight or nine thousand projects overall. Um, and you know, so it's really working. It's it's film, it's music, it's art, it's food, it's all kinds of different things. Um, but we have a lot of docs, a lot of feature films, and a lot of short content in in the video space. And is it completely open, or is it curated? Uh, it's open-ish. Um, basically, it's the internet, and the kinds of things people would want to raise money for, you know, are pretty terrible. Um, uh, we don't allow charity projects, uh, so we don't allow buy Jenny a prom dress or anything like that. Um, so it has to be a creative <laughs> project. So we have a screening process uh, just to make sure it's a creative project. And basically, you just fill out a form, and then, you know, within a day, we write back saying, cool, let's do it. And, and what percentage of the projects are successful in raising the funds? Because it's the, 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 the people who are putting their projects up, they kind of have to do a lot of the work, right? Yeah, I'm leaving a lot out. Um, so basically, for every project, the funding is all or nothing. So you say how much you want to raise, and you give yourself a timeline to do it. So 10 grand in 30 days. Uh, if you raise your 10 grand before the 30-day mark, then cool. You get all your money. Everyone's credit cards are charged at the deadline. If you come up even a dollar short, no one is charged anything, and everyone just walks away. So it's all or, it's all or nothing. Um, and about half the projects succeed in making their goal. Uh, the really interesting thing is that if you reach just 30% of your goal, you will succeed over 90% of the time. So if you have a core audience that believes in you and that gives a shit and that is willing to follow you and they demonstrate publicly that they're behind you, chances are very, very good that you will succeed. So um, I, one of the th another thing I've been at a lot of panels at Independent Film, <laughs> the Filmmaker Conference this week, so my, my brain is full of uh, all the things I, I've, I've been listening to. One of the things that came up a lot is that for first time for first time filmmakers, which I'm I, I don't know how many of you are first time filmmakers. So few um, is that a lot of the time it's actually uh, it, you know it's it's that chicken and egg situation of you know you need the relationships and the and the track record in order to get the funding but how do you get the track record without getting the funding to make your first film and uh, a lot of the people um, were saying that it's really it's friends and family the first time and and then and then you start you know you start working your way up and you start creating those relationships but what is it for you Ryan that positions a film in a way that makes you say, because I mean, you get, I, actually maybe you can talk a little bit about how many submissions you get. What is it that makes a film stand out for you? Is, is it the filmmaker? Is it the track record? Is it the subject matter? What is it? Well, I think it's um, all of the above in, in some ways. I, you know, first I'd like to say that um, with the TFI Documentary Fund, we are giving a $50,000 prize this year to a first time filmmaker. So, um, and, and I think every year with Gucci, uh, the fund we've supported, we have supported one or two first-time filmmakers. Um, but overall, I think what we're looking for, and I can't speak to Adela or, or Tamir, but um, you know, w unique access for me is everything. A story that we've never seen before, um, a character excuse me, that we've never seen before, access into a world that we've never seen before, and, and, and assuring the funder, me, that you have exclusive access into that world, I think is a big deal. Um, and that's actually number one. And I think, you know, the Gucci Fund, this is our fourth year that we've been doing it, and we've funded a wide array of filmmakers from, uh, you know, long established to newcomers. Um, and I think it's good to keep a healthy mix in there. But I think, you know, Tamir and I work at a nonprofit at Tribeca, um, and our goal is to um, empower and enable the first time filmmaker and, and give them the resources that they need to learn and um, to continue to learn and make their films over the years. Yeah, I'd like to echo that, that at Cinereach we also um, are, are for first-time filmmakers. Um, we like to take risks creatively um, in form and content. Um, character as 
access is not necessarily as important to us. Um, it's the idea, it's um, your creative vision behind it. Um, and of course, sample work is, is, is very important. You don't have to have made a feature film to be considered by us, um, but a little bit of sample work is quite important. Um, we all have funded f first time feature length filmmakers, but, but it, it is true that a, you know, a short goes a long, long way. So if you're able to make your first short on your own, um, that adds so much credibility to your ability as a filmmaker to be able to make and complete a film, which is just the risk of someone who's never made one before. And if I can quickly add, Tribeca All Access is built on taking chances and sort of championing the people who sometimes didn't necessarily have the access in the industry um, prior to the way that, you know, the system was sort of set up, if I may say. You know, but with us, we also are not necessarily um, looking for filmmakers who just kind of want to just come in with that one project. We're really actually interested in the career of the filmmaker. So it does speak to all the things that Ryan and Adela also mentioned. But for me, it's also important to see how a filmmaker, whether first time or even a established or going to even think about our brand and the program um, association and how that's going to work into their marketing, audience development, and even fundraising for their project. Um, so we definitely are, are really, really looking for filmmakers, whether you're first time or established, that's going to really understand how their career and their project fit within the total structure of what we do. Do you all support your filmmakers beyond cash? Oh, yeah. Do you want to just yeah, tell us how, how, how that works? Um, well, I mean, I think that, you know, we all talk amongst ourselves and, you know, besides the people up here, there are n a number of other nonprofit funding organizations out there and we're, we're all kind of colleagues and friends. Um, but, you know, we, we've done, we do rough cut screenings, we give notes, we've done buyer screenings. We, I introduce my projects to Adela after she, after I grant and she does the same for me. You know, our goal at the end of the day is really just to get these films made. And while we are really proud of the money we give our filmmakers, it's certainly not enough money in one pot to fund an entire film. So we are looking for many ways to give our filmmakers support. Um, and Tamir, I know, does a lot of other stuff that you can talk about. Absolutely. Uh, once you get notified in March that you are accepted to the project, we also are working out a partnership where each um, project that needs it would also have an experienced producer attached um, to sort of speak to exactly what your project needs, whether it's uh, packaging, maybe you need help with internet national co-production, various different things. So any project that needs it, we're going to do that. Um, that's also going to prepare you for the core of what the program is, is during the festival, we um, are very um, interested in setting up one-on-one -on -one meetings with the industry that comes. So Adela, for example, is one of the industry to actually meet with our project in a sort of formal setting where we do one-on-one 30-minute -on -one meetings. That's going to hopefully lead to more deals, um, networking, and hopefully continue to sort of build your portfolio of industry. Um, in addition to that, we do tons of workshops and panels during the festival. Um, and then we are really, really, as I mentioned before, paying attention to our year-round support for our alumni. Um, so we also have some programming during the festival for them as well. We accredit every pro uh, filmmaker that comes into the program during the festival with the badge so they also have access to what's going on in the festival and after that we also continue with additional grant opportunities for our alum in addition to several other workshops and panels as well for them to participate in. Um, yeah, and I should mention that Cinereach, there are three arms to the company. Um, so I manage the grants department, and my colleague, Riva Goldberg, um, manages the fellowship program, which selects four filmmakers um, who are either self-taught or just out of school working to make their um, a career and, and will submit ideas for a short film. Um, and it's a six or seven month uh, program where we mentor and shepherd the, the filmmakers to complete the film. And so the grants program often works with the fellowship arm. Sometimes some of grant, Cinereach grantees will be act as advisors or mentors to the um, younger filmmakers. And um, beyond just for the grantees, it's not just about the cash because, you know, as I said, it, the, the grant ranges from five to 50,000, which can't possibly fund an entire feature length film. So. Um, um, we do everything from rough cut screenings, as Ryan mentioned, um, introducing filmmakers to distributors or other funders, um, helping publicize festival screenings or premieres, whatever we can do beyond the life of our grant to help the film get out there and um, get more support. Yeah, I think, I mean, we've even gone so far as to, you know, a film shooting in India to find an Indian producer, 
to you know kind of connect lots of dots that are lingering out there. And I know Tamir has often gotten camera packages and editing packages, and you ha I know you have editing suites in, mm -hmm. you, in your mm -hmm. office. So I mean, I think the check writing is just the, a very small part of what we do, and it's the kind of the guidance and guiding your film to the marketplace, which is kind of what people don't realize that our organizations can, can provide for them. And obviously, uh, you know, as has become clear, n none of you are really funding projects that the the full project, right? It's 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 little bits of money here, little bits of money there. Well, lots of bits of money here, lots of bits of money there. Um, but you really do need to put a put a package together. Um, so uh, you know, one of the things. Um, that I think would be really useful to talk about here beyond you know how to apply to these guys obviously is actually like you know a little bit more about as a filmmaker what you, what work you need to do in order to find those connections and and, and actually position your project in a way that it, you're going to be able to really launch it um, and one of the things I was wondering with Kickstarter is I mean, what are the projects that have been the, the projects that have been really successful what is it that the the the, the creatives have done in order to you know, I mean, is it a lot of social media marketing? Uh, what is it that makes them work? Or is it just a really good idea? Uh, it's kind of a mix of all those things. I mean, the interesting thing is that, you know, when you're raising money through Kickstarter, you're not, um, you know, applying for a grant or something like that. You're just appealing to your peers and, and often your friends and family. So the sorts of things, sorts of value judgments they're making are about, you know, do I like this person? Does this seem sincere? Is this something that I would care to see? You know, and it's not trying to think about what's the potential viability of this. And so I think it's a, it's a different way to think about it. So the projects that do well are honestly probably the projects that are going to eventually be really good, or people who are really good at expressing their ideas. You know, on on camera, most products are driven by a video of someone saying, you know, I'm Jill. This is the movie. You know, here's the story behind it, and here's the trailer, and that makes a connection with people that they that they really you know it just it feels good you know you have this affinity with this project you walk by film forum two years later you see the movie poster you grab your girlfriend you're like I we helped make that you know that's our movie too you know and that and that really happens um, you know the interesting thing is that you know like all the stuff that they provide in terms of mentorship and, and access, I mean that stuff is incredibly valuable. And you know, we're idiots. You know, we don't know how to do any of that stuff. I don't have any sort of film background, and I you know deferred to them on all those things. How did um, you get the idea for Kickstarter? Mm. Uh, let me, I'll finish this thought, and then well, I'm just going to say the one thing that we do provide is that you know the, when you make a film. Um, you know, I think people think about, they wait to think about audience till the very end. Like, all right, well, it's done. We're going to put it out. Let's hope that someone will want to see it. But it's a weird way to think about it, because you should really be thinking about that from the very beginning, because that's a long slog. You know, that's like, it's like a campaign, you know, like a political campaign. Every day you're picking up a couple more people. And so the one interesting thing that a Kickstarter project can do, even if you don't need the 10 grand or whatever, um, you know, you, you, your uncle is that rich and good for you. Um, but if, you know, if, if you don't need that money, uh, it's still, it's, it's making people aware of what you're doing. And, and it can be anyone from, you know, your peers on the internet to your actual friends who are like, look at this thing that I'm doing, you know, appreciate this, get excited about it. And it's an excuse to talk about, you know, what it is that your passion is going into. Um, and so what's interesting is that you're making people aware of your work and your film even before it's done. Uh, and it also adds an added social layer to make sure you actually finish it, which is also good. Um, as for where Kickstarter came from, uh, my partner Perry Chen um, had the idea uh, in 2001, 2002, he was living in New Orleans and he was trying to put on a concert. And um, he was going to have to front about 20 grand to do it and he thought that was ridiculous. So he wished that there was a way he could just find out how many people were interested ahead of time and if that a certain threshold were met, then the concert would happen. If not. No, no problems, everyone just walks away. Um, so he had that idea and then uh, he and I met and he just sort of shared that concept with me and then we started working on it together about five years ago at this point. And you launched last year? And we launched last year. Neither of us are coders, um, so we were very inept and had to find much smarter people than us to help us do it. But yeah, last year, last April it finally went live. And uh, just to put you on the spot slightly um, about uh, sort of great bigger issues around uh, uh, the sustainability of film, um, uh, one of the things you said on the panel earlier today was about how you used to be in the music business and that one of the things you noticed there is that people were just desperately trying not to die more slowly. Um, and, yeah. and do you see that now that you're sort of looking at film people, do you see us doing the same kind of slow die? Yeah, thing? I mean, I think... <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm not trying to be depressing. I mean, <laughs> I do. I worry for film. I do. Because, you know, you can see where the Prince of Persia type things, how those continue to exist. And you can see how, 
you know, mumblecore continues to exist, but that in between is tough, you know, and that's definitely something that I'm concerned about. And but you know, I think the the film industry is like the music industry of '99 or 2000, where everyone's just sort of seeing that things are crumbling and trying to figure out what's going to take its place. And if people are smart and they're resourceful and they're ambitious, you know, it's very possible to carve out space for yourself right now. You know, it's, it's, it's a land grab. And if you have an idea, you can just go for it. I and mean, it's kind of what Kickstarter was. Um, and, you know, I think, so I think there's a lot of opportunity there. And, you know, I, all the people who decide to make movies because they want to walk a red carpet, you know, those people don't do this anymore. They go become eye bankers instead or something. And so the people who are doing it because they want, you know, their, their purest passion to appear somewhere on a screen and just for one other person to see it and to like it, you know, those people, they're going to do okay. And they're going to build real audiences. And if you have an audience and you're doing it for the right reasons, like, you don't need to worry. You know, you'll be able to have a working class life as an artist. And I think that's very admirable. Um, I just wanted to jump in here. Did the, um you know, Cinereach gives these small grants, but but we're, we're really looking to fund independent filmmakers. And um, you know, making a film, a feature-length film, takes years. Uh, so it's not something that you would do to get rich or become famous. It's something that you would put your blood and guts into every day for years. It will take a long time to raise that money if you're successful in raising it all. And that's just that's just the reality of it. Doesn't mean that it can't happen, but it takes a long time. And I think that's just part of being a filmmaker or an artist these days. But I, so I mean, the reason I brought this up is not to depress you all, but because I think, um, you know, having done a lot of these panels, I think it's disingenuous and actually dishonest to, to talk about, you know, film. I mean, we're all here because we love film and we're passionate about it and we want to support it and it's what we do. Um, but that it's dishonest to have a conversation about it without actually, without, while ignoring the realities of, of the film business as it is right now and um, and what it actually takes to make a living as a filmmaker. Um, and I know that, you know, one of the things that often comes up is that, you know, for a lot of people it actually has to sort of become a hobby and that you have another job that supports your, your life as a filmmaker um, because it's not sustainable. And I, I'm just wondering, you know, do you do you think that actually that is the case? Or is there is there a way to um, to go to move from project to project because obviously funding is only half the battle, right? There's also the distribution and marketing on the other end, which is the other 50 percent. Well, I can speak a little to that because I think one of the things that all of us have universal, we um, agree upon, whether we have specific qualifications for our program, is that we all are looking for good storytelling. So at the end of the day, it really does fall behind really getting good stories told. Um, that being said, I find that a lot of times people apply for the Trebek All Access program because we're very competitive. They may not get in the program one year, but then they don't work on sort of developing the story by the time they reapply. Um, and in, in between that, I give you an example of a filmmaker who actually had applied several times to our program with his project. Um, from there, even though he got told no, he continued to make short films. Those short films allowed him to therefore get into film festivals, some small, some big. Um, but being a filmmaker at a festival is much different than a ticket buyer because, of course, the industry is going to view you different. You're networking. You're seeing different. You're using it to continue to talk about your project. So, you know, after he has every year sort of applying to, you know, not only Trebek All Access, but he's done the Sundance Lab, gotten rejected, continued to really just keep honing his skill as a director and telling great stories. And eventually he got into our program, and now he's actually just wrapped his production um, just three months after the festival finished, using not only the, the sort of branding and backing of us, but all those other festivals that he were continuing to enter into with his short films. So I, I think definitely you need to, whether you're waiting for one of us to sort of say yes, continuing to work on just telling great stories. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think the city is full of artists and not even in the discipline of film. I mean, cities, actors and visual artists, other visual artists, and, you know, all of them have other jobs, whether it be waiting tables or, or whatnot. Um, so you need to continue pushing your yourself forward in your art and it's hard work. I mean, I've done it uh, in the past and I'm sure my colleagues up here have done it um, in some other capacity, but um, it's not easy, but uh, like Tamir said, you have to continue to push yourself and you will have to find second jobs or third jobs to maintain yourself, but it only takes one break um, and one person to really care about what you're doing, whether it be at HBO or at the BBC in England or 
someone else who can really support you that can give you money for your film and then help develop your second film and I've seen it happen all the time. What's I think what I feel really good about kind of this economic crash here um, is that it's happening overseas now and it's you know our filmmakers here used to get money from broadcasters that would take them from project to project to project and that's been happening up until about last year or, or two years ago um, in the UK and France and now they're really in the same place that we are but they are so much further behind because we've been doing this, you know, for the past seven or eight years. Um, so they're, you know, they that their money, the broadcast money overseas is so much greater than here, and it always has been, but it's not anymore. So I feel like for the first time, really, the entire world of film, independent filmmakers are doing the same thing everywhere. And I feel like, um, I feel hopeful that we're kind of rise above this. Or at least and if we're out. suffering, everyone else is suffering with us. God damn it, yes. <laughs> um, I also want, I mean, I, I, I went to art school where, where we talked about concept and, and execution and, and idea, and um, but I was never taught a lot about business. Um, and I think something that in the, truly independent filmmaking today involves a lot of business, learning, building up your business skills in terms of marketing, networking, knowing how to talk to people about your project. Um, if you get one grant, you have to use that to leverage to get another one. And so learning to maybe get another producer on board who has more experience, or if you get a grant from CineReach, going to Ryan and being like, hey, I got a grant from CineReach, leveraging maybe going to Yancey and saying, okay, now I'm going to start a Kickstarter campaign. That's just a um, skill set that I think will, will really help you in the end and something that, that uh, you can work on, including your storytelling ability. Absolutely. I mean, I think it's impossible to to get um, an entire resource from getting your to getting your film made from one source anymore, um, because the broadcasters don't have that money. I think there might be one broadcaster who can fund your film it, like from completion. I mean, maybe one production company. So now, like the, the reality is, is that you have to cobble your resource together, and that's kind of what, what's so great about Kickstarter is that you can not have any or a very little footage and get raise enough money to get enough footage to show me or. To Tamir or Adela to get more money and then you can show it to Sundance or to Fledgling Fund or Chicken, you know, it's, I, I think it's, it's I think we're thing, in the right direction. I, I think it's that thing for filmmakers as well, psychologically, that, you know, one of the things you have to do, because it's, it's really easy to give up at any point in the process. I mean, people want to give up in the edit when they're want to give up week. every day. Yeah. Right. <laughs> so I think one of the things as a filmmaker is actually that, that, that thing of creating a sense of inevitability for yourself and for the film that like your film is going to get made. And I think one of the great things about Kickstarter and, and other web platforms is that it's actually giving filmmakers that that platform to create that sense of inevitability, that sense of like, I'm driving this, it's going to get made, um, you know, rather than just having a treatment on paper um, that, that that can then drive them forward. Because I've, I've noticed that with a couple, it feels like a lot of, um, some of those Kickstarter platforms then sort of lead to other things for the filmmakers beyond just raising the money. Uh, yeah, I today met a guy who, um, who came across a project on Kickstarter, a documentary, and gave them $120,000 just because he liked their project. Um, that's obviously a special case. Uh, but, you know, it is a good place just to showcase what it is that you do. And, you know, the nice thing is that I, I'll speak about the past as, like I know what I'm talking about. But, I, you know, funding has always been a black box, I think, for all of art. You know, there's just sort of no one likes to talk about where they get their money because you're not supposed to talk about money because you're an artist. And then no one really knows anything. And everyone is sort of negotiating blindly on, on terms that are not agreed upon by anybody. Um, but moving that out into the open with, you know, applying for grants or things like Kickstarter or, I don't know, every other different kind of way that you can find money, that's good. You know, that's empowering. It's you have some control over this. You can grind it out, you know, and obviously things are cheaper and all that. And I think all that together just means that more art can be created than there was before. Um, and then you have the problem of how to get people to pay attention to it. But that's another right. that's another well, panel, we'll, I guess. We'll, we'll, we'll touch on that. But I, I do, I'm just coming back to Ryan's point about, you know, it, that the way Europe is moving more towards the American model. I come from a European background, uh, broadcasting background. I used to work for Channel 4 Television in the UK. And one of the things I noticed when I moved to New York six years ago was how entrepreneurial filmmakers were here and actually how incredible that was. And even though it was a hard slog, <clears throat> Sorry, um, it was a hard slog. That incredible work was getting produced, and I had no idea how. I didn't. I mean, it's like these guys were pulling money out of the air, but work was getting made. And actually, what was happening in the UK is all the documentaries. I come from a documentary background. It was turning to reality TV. Documentaries just weren't getting funded anymore. And instead of you know going out and sort of figuring out new ways of getting money, a lot of filmmakers just kind of went like they just didn't know what to do. So I do think that. 
you know, there, there is obviously a tension between, you know, your work as a as an artist and your work as a as a business person. And I know that's a, a huge tension for a lot of people, and it's the subject of many many debates. Um, but I do think that one of the, the the incredible things about filmmaking here is is how entrepreneurial it is. And even if you only consider yourself an artist, you're probably much more entrepreneurial than you think you are, mm -hmm. because I just think you have to be. Um, but one of the um, one of the other things that I think is interesting now is actually how how technology has changed. Um, how, how you can actually get the word out about your film and how you can connect with audiences differently. So I was just wondering if we could talk a bit about that and also about um, pitching forums and other ways of connecting with money because, I mean, that's a, that, that can be a great platform to actually hone your project and make your project better. Mm -hmm. Do you want to just talk about some pitching forums that are actually worth going to? Yeah, sure. I mean, well, I think uh, we're obviously at the end of the Independent Film Week in New York. Well, it's not a pitching forum, it's a market. Um, but they accept, gosh, I know there were 70 documentary projects, works in progress there this year. And I, I don't even know how many narrative, but I mean, probably overall about 150 works in progress films, or maybe even 200, um, to pitch. You're pitching directly um, to people. After, after this week, um, there's a pitching forum in Camden, Maine, which I think the three of us from this panel will be on next week, um, which is a, a really sweet um, new nonfiction festival in Maine um, that is getting a lot of attention. Um, after that, there's Sheffield, which is in the UK in early November, um, which is a, a similar to what's happened, what's going on here right now, which is more of a market where you have one-on-one -on -one meetings. Uh, but the biggest, I think, the biggest documentary festival in the world is in uh, Amsterdam, ITFA, over Thanksgiving which is a major, major pitching forum where you essentially, um, they select, gosh, probably about 30 or 40 projects and you pitch, you have seven minutes, you show three minutes of footage and you speak for four minutes in front of a room full of about 30 to 35 broadcasters from all over the world. Um, and it's the most intimidating, strange spectator sport experience you can imagine. But it one, one shot, you can get the entire budget that you need and you can impress upon the world, or you can also, um, you know, bomb, bomb big time. Um, and then, yeah, and then, and then, you know, there is uh, Tribeca All Access during Tribeca, and then Hot Docs, uh, which is in Canada, which is in May, which is another huge forum and also market. So you have these one-on-one -on -one meetings and also kind of you're pitching to a, a large room. Um, but throughout the year, there's also a forum in Copenhagen. I mean, you'll see most of these forums, which are very traditional um, in, in Europe. Um, but America is kind of adapting them, and people like myself or Adela will sit on them now because we have money to give and the money that the broadcasters um, have to give is, is not as much as it used to be. So um, the world is changing. Ryan, quickly. you seem quite happy about the collapse of uh, money in, <laughs> in Europe. Well, I'm just happy that we're on the same page. <laughs> There's also for the narrative side, uh, especially if you're looking to get into LA market, um, of course you know Sundance have several labs, but there's also Film Independent that I think also does a great job of curating a lot of projects and having industry do one-on-one -on -one meetings uh, with their projects as well. So definitely should check them out as well. And IFP do labs um, beyond the, uh, the, the market and conference that's just happened, they have um, narrative and documentary labs every year, um, which you can apply for. Um, Is this on your wiki? Yeah, I think it's on my wiki. Well, if it's not my wiki, you can add it to my wiki. The idea, the, the, this is actually um, something that we can talk about now. Um, you know, how, how you can use uh, social media and, and new technology to promote your films. One of the things I discovered with um, my wiki is that you know the idea of a wiki, like Wikipedia, is anyone can contribute, but kind of doesn't turn out that way. You um, you kind of have to do most of the work yourself, which I think is probably what you know a lot of filmmakers find. Um, it, it, if you build it, they will not necessarily come. So, <laughs> so. Um, um, what do you do to get attention online? Um, I mean, my advice would be, I mean, the, the most fruitful way is to, to reach people online. First is email far and away. So, you know, a really nice personal email. Don't send mass emails. Write an individual email to each person. Um, I did my own Kickstarter project a while ago, and I thought that it would be an immediate hit, and it wasn't. And I <laughs> sulked about it for a day. And then I read an interview that we had done with this one creator who had said that she had sat down and written a personal email to everyone in her contact list talking about her project. 
So I was like, all right, I'll do that. And I sat down for a whole day and wrote an email to all these people, and it worked. All these people suddenly you know, got involved in a way they hadn't when I sent them the email blast two days before. Um, so really, like, effort pays off. Uh, in terms of social media, Facebook is valuable. Twitter is not um, in terms of actually getting people to do stuff. It makes sense. Facebook is a stronger connection if I post something on my Facebook page. You know, people I probably actually know will see it. Twitter, it's hard to tell where it goes. I mean, certainly things can catch on with Twitter, but in our experience, people are much less likely to act that way. Um, yeah. And another thing, I mean, just like he's mentioned with Twitter, I mean, I think people who are the most successful on Twitter are those who understand um, not to use it as a tool for self-promotion, but more sometimes to create dialogue um, amongst people um, and encouraging that. One of our filmmakers, I think he had the best use for his website. Um, he just came into, into the program with a project called Peace After Marriage, which is basically about a comedy of a Palestinian American who is sort of have this porn addiction. And as he go into sort of this AA meeting to sort of get over his uh, porn addiction, he meets this uh, this Israeli uh, woman who's about to be deported and needs to be uh, have a, a green card. So out of sympathy, he sort of decides he's going to marry, of course, this you know Israeli woman and sort of live in New York City and all the sort of complications that comes with dating. Um, so on his website, instead of just making a website that's just about his film and promoting his film, he actually has a blog and he deals with sort of showing wherever like a lot of different things where Arab Americans sort of cross uh, with uh, different sort of things in, a, in New York that are funny and situations that you would kind of think are sort of wacky or out of character or whatever the case may be. So it's really sort of this fresh pop new idea of really trying to look at you know Arab American sort of culture instead of just promoting himself in his film. And he actually gets quite a lot of bit of uh, traffic to it as well. So I mean I think it's a really, really smart way of sort of just using your website to draw in people and say, by the way, of course I have a film. Right. Adela, do you have any social media advice? Um, well, I mean, we are, are both, Sinreach has a, a Facebook fan page and, and a Twitter page, and um, you know, we, we help promote films from, from when they receive a, a grant, like when they get a, a Gucci Tribeca grant or, or um, a Sundance grant or a, a you know, festival premiere um, or pick up a distribution deal. And um, I think the more you, you reach out to a fan base, so if you have a Kickstarter campaign, those people will hopefully become fans on your Facebook page and you keep them up to date with what's happening and it, it helps them invest in your project. And I think the more you have people invest in it, the more they want to see it succeed. So so sort of not isolating yourself and, and going out there and, and letting people keep, keep keeping of course don't tire them out with tons of you know newsletters every day but right. but um you know I think that that's a really effective way of, of making sure people are up to date and, and want to help contribute and see it succeed yeah look out for fatigue fatigue you know you can really burn people if you hit it too hard and without you know, really meaning it. Um, you know, if you're just tweeting every day, if everyone, you know, gave me X amount of money, we'd be all be millionaires, you know, I'm gonna think you're an asshole when I look at that, like, you know, who cares? Um, so, yeah, fatigue is definitely something to, to, to look out for. Uh, the other thing I was gonna say is that the beautiful thing is that no one knows what they're doing, so everyone's just making stuff up, you know? You could try whatever you want, you could try everything, but just try to do stuff that feels right to you, you know? Try not to, to whore yourself out too much. Just be yourself and try to communicate it. And some things will work, some things will don't, and that's fine. That's fine. You just have to figure it out on your own. Just be yourself unless you're an asshole. <laughs> even then. Even then. <laughs> I think um, one of the uh, one of the key pieces of advice is um, you know to if you create a, a website for your film to collect email addresses on the home page of your website in a really prominent place, but also create um, collect zip codes at the same time. And there's software, m most of the um, email software, like Constant Contact and MailChimp and any of those, they'll have plugins, so it's super easy to do. Um, and the reason it's good to collect the um, zip code is that if you are, you know, once you've got your film made, um, if you are taking it around the country, people in Seattle don't care if your film's screening in New York and vice versa. So you can actually break it down so that you're not hounding people, and that can be really useful. Um, and it just means that you can be really specific, geographically specific, about who you're targeting with your messages. So zip codes and emails together are a really good idea. Um, and the other thing I was going to say is um, remember on Twitter that you know if your film is screening at 3 o'clock at the Angelica, someone only needs to see that once and then they've heard it and they don't need to hear it again. Um, and I think someone once said um, this idea of hosting, not posting, is, a, you know, is the way to think about it. And I think that's right because 
that, that when, you, when you get a Twitter stream, I mean, it, and this is not just from filmmakers, it's from anyone where it's like, my film is shown at three o'clock, my film is shown at five o'clock, my film is shown at six o'clock. It's just not that interesting. And Twitter is a conversation, so that's, I, I'm a huge Twitter fan, so I defend it. Um, but it, it's, only, it's only good for me if it's a conversation, not a promotional tool. Well, obviously it's a promotional tool too, but you've got to sneak it in the back door. And then also tools like Kickstarter and Facebook is good for another thing and tracking audience development on demographics, age, and race of people who are interested in your film. And that speaks volume when you're looking for fundraising or even once you're ready to distribute the film as well. Um, do you want to talk just a little bit more about, um, uh, I, I realize we are maybe talking, a, 45. Um, we're going we're gonna to leave lots of time for questions, by the way, because um, uh, that way we can make sure that we're actually answering the stuff that you want to know about. Um, and I know we have been talking quite a lot about documentary, so if you have specific narrative questions, it's just my background's dark, so I'm really biased, and I apologize. Um, uh, in terms of actually um, connecting with uh, people who can help you, I mean, beyond you guys, obviously, um, c connecting with executive producers, um, casting agents, uh, are there... Are there things like the labs or, or forums that you can advise people to go to in order to like reach the people they need to reach? Like, How do you actually connect with the people who can help you take your project forward? <laughs> Are we Ryan. for me? Yes. Um, you know, I, it's, it's kind of an, um, a catch-22. I mean, I think that you've got to spend money to do that a little bit. Um, you know, I'm not sure that, you know, we all are based in New York, I would assume, in this room. So, you know, most of the independent film world is here. So IFP Week is great to buy a pass to the conference that's here. But other than that, um, the Sundance Film Festival is, you know, the place that every single person in the entire world goes um, and, and hangs out on this one street that's far too small for everyone to be hanging out. Um, so, you know, kind of getting strategic and picking those one or two festivals around the world, whether they're a marker or not, that you know that a lot of industry are going to go to, um, are key. And, and I would highly recommend buying a pass to Tribeca or Toronto or Sundance or Idfa or wherever. Um, and I think also, besides that, also kind of watching whatever film you're making, documentary or narrative, watching the end credits and um, looking to see who funded it, who the executive producers are in the film. I mean, I think the one big myth about all of us is that we're not accessible. I mean, the thing that you have to realize with every executive producer who is on every film, except for maybe, you know, Hollywood stuff, but independent films, we work in an office with maybe two other people tops. Um, and that, you know, we all have websites and there's emails and phone numbers on those websites and we're guaranteed to get your message. Um, we're guaranteed if we don't open your mail, someone who sits next to us opens your mail. So, I mean, I think that you kind of find those like-minded um, uh, films that are like yours and look to see who worked on them. And I think, you know, reach out that way. I have I did that when I was tr trying to break into the, to the industry. You know, I looked, I went to school at Syracuse University and I looked to see who at Syracuse became an executive producer after I left. And I called all of them. And... Um, None, they, none of them helped me, but they offered to help. Um, but you know, it, I mean, it, but it's like you know, people are. I I think that we're much more accessible than people actually think we are. Yeah, I, I, I would agree with that. I mean, I have an email address. We have an office. We have a, um, a, a telephone number. If you send me a nice email, hi, my name is this, and this is my project, and you know, I'm I'm looking for funding, and I'd love to have a coffee with you to learn more about your organization. If I have the time to meet with you, I will do it. Um, but I think the important thing is to ap approach people like us like we're people and not, you don't need to be super aggressive or pushy because that I think does the opposite. Um, I know everyone, it's highly competitive, but I'm just like you guys and when someone approaches me and has a passionate idea and they just want to have a cup of coffee without expecting that that's going to lead to something and get me interested in their film, I'm happy to do that. But I think um, sometimes when it becomes so competitive and people have applied to grants and they've been rejected, they don't know how to approach it in just a sort of softer manner. And I think that's just important to keep in mind. And don't take rejection personal, of yeah. course, because, you know, sometimes we say far no to more projects than we like to because you just don't have the room to support them in the same way. And also, I mean, 
timing is everything because mm-hmm. I mean I'm accessible but if you try to catch me a month before the festival mm-hmm. I might not be so accessible so you know like you really should pay attention to you know not only when you're approaching people but what specifically you're asking for because sometimes you could be the nicest person but if I don't know specifically what you need I won't know how to actually help you um, so definitely be really really specific on what you need and if you don't know that be honest and let's have a conversation and pick my brain I think it's really key as well that you know not only you don't take I mean it's hard not to take rejection personally because you're being rejected but um, <laughs> It's really hard to hear no, but that I think a lot, a lot of the time what happens with filmmakers that I know is that they don't apply again. They think that that means I never want to see your project again. Go away. Don't darken my door. And actually, that's like the biggest mistake in the world. I mean, most filmmakers to get ITVS funding for docs, they have to apply for six, six times, six years before they get the funding. Um, and often people do really want to hear back from you. They just they just need more work on your project. So you you must apply again and again and again and not give up. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we, when, no, we, not, no. when we come down to our finalists, I mean, it's kind of like like programming a film festival. Um, you know, we kind of look for a range of, of projects, a range of directors, where they're from in the world, male and female, race. So a lot of things come into play. And sometimes you, you leave out, you have to leave out films because they just don't fit in that mix for that certain round. So, you know, no, in terms of funding, in, with the grant world, I mean, that means you should come back and apply and show us, like Tamira said earlier, that you've made progress and that you're in a different place. And don't send an email as soon as you get rejected because you'll really regret it. <laughs> don't, don't. And also, I mean, I won't say his name because he probably would kill me on, if I said his name publicly. But I'll give you an example. There was a filmmaker who wrote this really beautiful project, you know, really beautiful, but it was a really high budget, high concept film, and he did not direct anything yet sort of just like a PSA that didn't really speak to volume that he can handle this high budget film. So I called him up because when I tell you this project was very, very well written, I called him up and I asked him, I said, Are you, do you want to direct this? He said, yeah, this is my baby. You know, I want to direct this. And me personally, you know, our project is our program is trying to find a reason to say yes because so many people have said no. So, you know, I'm not going to be the type to tell them, well, I don't really know if you're ready to necessarily direct this, but really try to see, you know, if realistically we put a 30 plus million dollar project in front of an industry person who, to them, it is a business. And keep in mind when you're meeting with the industry, sometimes they have to also pitch to their colleague to convince their colleagues to come on board, you know, as well to sort of invest in this project. So, you know, to realistically put a 30 million dollar project in front of an industry person who's thinking business and don't share that same passion that you might have for the project, which is a PSA, isn't really realistic. So after having a conversation to him, I said, you know what, what else are you working with, we're working on? And it came to find out he was working with a much more smaller micro budget film that was really doable, you know, $300,000. He had some um, access to some producers who he had met down the road who would be able to speak volume to that type of project. And we basically put the project and package together that made more sense to where he was at in that, in that sort of time. And doing that, he came into the project and the project was completed. Um, had he came in with a $30 million project, as much as I might have wanted to champion him, the, the, the realistic view of it is that there wouldn't be much industry that I know I could put him in front of and really tell them to put $30 million in a project that they couldn't convince their colleague it was a good investment, especially in this economy. So sometimes be smart about the choices and then the timing on what type of project you're actually going forward to. You know, it may be wait before you go out for that sort of higher fish. I think also um, going back to Yancy's uh, point about you know just being yourself and being a nice person is you you know yeah you're, you're more than just filmmakers you're people and and so are we and um, I think one of the other problems as well is that you know you're if 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 you there, there does tend to be this like slightly unhealthy relationship sometimes where you sort of feel like you're always cap in hand like please sir can I have some more sir um, and always pitching and actually just it's 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 crazy like everyone wants to make good films happen and that kind of relationship I think is really unhealthy for everyone it just makes everyone everyone feel uncomfortable so you know not to always be pitching and sometimes to go to a film festival and get really drunk with someone is the, the best way to actually create a relationship <laughs> not that kind of relationship actually that can happen too <laughs> so uh, yeah um, but I do think you know to, just to always remember that we are also I mean all of us we're all people not just pitches um, and you don't want to end up feeling like you're constantly sort of you know trying to sell something because then you just feel like a salesman um, all right, so on that note, um, we're going to go to questions and you can't pitch. Um, <laughs> if you want to submit anything to any of these people, they're all going to tell you how to get in touch with them at the end of this panel and you can submit through their regular cycles because they can't help you 
they can't give you a yes or no here anyway. So, but if you have any questions um, about anything other than a pitch, then um, I think, do we have mic? Yeah, this one here. And ask anything, except for pitching. <laughs> Hi, thank you for the information. Um, I'm just interested to know, especially for Tamir and Adela, for your, um, do you take films that are, do the films that you take, do they have to be shot here in the United States or can they be international films? No, I mean, they can be international. Definitely, we, we encourage that. I mean, where there's no boundary or restriction in terms of where your film takes place. Do you want to talk about fiscal sponsorship a bit? Oh, yeah. Um, okay, so we fund fiction and, and nonfiction. Um, and as a nonprofit, in order for us to channel the funds to you, you need to um, spawn, um, you need to find a fiscal sponsor, which is another nonprofit organization that will accept the funds for you and disperse them for you and, and take care of your reporting and your taxes. Um, so for fiction films, that becomes a little more complicated, and it also becomes complicated for international applicants. But um, if you're based in New York, or sorry, in the States, then um, that's not an issue. And you have a list of them on your website, don't yes, you? Yes, we have a great resources page on our website. It's cinereach.org. If you go to the resources page under the grants and awards uh, tab, there's um, a very comprehensive list of funders, fiscal sponsors, and distributors. And as for us, we have no restrictions on the type of story you tell. It can be, you know, as long as it's feature limb, doc, or narrative. Um, unfortunately, we don't take filmmakers who are not U.S. based. Um, you don't have to be a U.S. citizen. You just have to be U.S. based. But we do have partnerships, international ones. Um, one with the Canadian Film Center, so we do get some filmmakers that way. And the U.K. Film Council, which unfortunately um, <laughs> is not going to be in existence past this uh, year, but um, we're, still gonna, we're still going <laughs> to continue to... Uh, <laughs> We're still going to continue to work with other uh, international partners. Yancy, can people give tax-deductible donations through Kickstarter? Can you have a fiscal sponsor? Uh, yeah, if you have a fiscal sponsor, if you're a 501c3, the money is, is tax-deductible. More questions? One right here. Um, for Adela, um, what if the nonprofit um, I would be working with is in an international base nonprofit? Um, they, okay, that, that gets tricky, but really the, they would need to have an office based in the U.S. and an office based in that country. Okay. I think this one, can you just pass it down the line and we'll, we'll keep going back. Um, for open access, you mentioned um, having one person attached to the project or at least one person who's an underrepresented group. Um, what are those groups in for you? <laughs> I was that's, that that's, that's, that's always a tricky line. I yeah. mean, to be honest with you, let me just be direct. It's filmmakers of color and women of, of all races. Um, okay. Particularly the reason is because the program grew as an answer to the fact that statistically, those have been the groups who have not been able to get you know, you know jobs. That being said, anyone can participate. As long as the project have at least one of those writers or directors, and in fact we have had every year at least you know some type of uh, sort of combination of that. And as I mentioned, there's no criteria. So just because you're a woman, we don't necessarily say you have to tell a woman's story, or just because you're Mexican doesn't mean you have to tell a Mexican story, you know. Yeah. So it's really to be you know, direct, that's what it is. And but uh, keep in mind, it's really for emerging and established filmmakers as well. If um, any women filmmakers as well who are making sp uh, specifically social issue documentaries should also look at Chicken and Egg uh, because they specifically fund um, female filmmakers and they also have a really great mentorship program so they'll mentor your project um, as well as um, give you some cash. And, and fledgling fund as well, if you're looking for support on the distribution and outreach that are worth looking at. They partner a lot with Chicken and Egg. What behind you? Hi, thanks for coming. Um, so if I am lucky and I do get like thirty or fifty thousand dollars from you guys or some other source, uh, in in your experience, um, who uh, what's the best strategy to use that money in order to get the rest of your funds? Like if I have a three hundred thousand dollar movie, um, what have you in your experience? What have been the best strategies to to um, leverage that thirty thousand? Yeah, well, for both Tamir and I, when you apply for our grants, um, we specifically ask you how much you have to you have to ask you have to give an ask, and you have to kind of declare what you will specifically use that money for. Um, you know, of course, we don't we can't monitor that or or manage that, but you know, in in terms of when you submit, we hope that you will come to the table prepared, and that helps us to kind of make decisions better at the end. And how do they find the rest of the money? 
once you know if you if you give thirty thousand and they have a three hundred thousand budget, how do they find the other two hundred and? Well, we're hoping that you know, hopefully, you know, if say if you're filming if you're making a film in Africa, that's if I give you thirty thousand dollars, that will enable you to get to Africa with your crew to to shoot what you need to do, come back and edit a piece that's a little bit more that tells us a little bit more about your film, that gives us a little more sense of your character and story, and then you can leverage that and give it to Adela, and then she'll see something more, um, and then you know. Adela does re-granting often? Not no? Often. Sometimes? Not often. <laughs> Sundance, the Sundance Institute will give you a grant and then you can go back to them for re-grants. Um, and I think, you know, as long as you keep preparing your sample and, and, and keeping it up to date with the money you get, I think that it can leverage other money. I, Oftentimes I, in these pitching forums as well, when people give you money, other people will come in too. So my $10,000 might not get you very far, but there are five other people that could be behind me that say, because he came in, I'll come in. So you know, you have to kind of use that money to leverage these other, money, these other monies, but spend it wisely, just not on your rent. You um, I, I, I would not encourage um, sort of reapplying to the same organization once you've already been granted from that organization. Um, for the same project, you mean? Yeah, for the same project. Right. Yeah, yeah, for, for the same project, obviously, for your next one. But. Um, you know, we, we want to see the film succeed, but we don't want you to rely on us as the only source of funding. And so, you know, the idea to demonstrate that you've been able to use that 30,000 um, and not buy a car, you know, but actually help make a piece of your film that you can then send to Ryan or Tamir or Sundance and say, wow, look what I did with my 30,000. You know, I think this could benefit from another 30. That, you know, so you you decide where that that will help leverage your project, and and I don't know if there's a one one size fits all. It's where you are, how big your project is, you know, what do you really need to get it done? And so just, so, okay. and some of our um, filmmakers has been successful at using that money to attach people to it. So maybe there's a casting director with really great credentials that can get you talent, but also show to the sort of caliber of your project. Um, but really, really much what Ryan was saying. I mean, I think management of the money so that you don't just blow it all say on rent. It's really key because as the funder, as we are, we're looking to see it an, as an investment and how you're going to use it. But even to uh, the industry, no one really likes to be the first money in. They kind of want to make sure. <laughs> well, if, if you're talking about sort of like a business, um, of right. course, they're... It's the first grant is the hardest. Yes. And grants yes. attract grants. So when you're talking about companies that are in it for profit, like, you know, as, as opposed to our, our sort of organizations, I mean, as she said, we also do like to have the discovery sort of uh, model for ourselves. But I'm talking about for companies that are for business. You know, they sometimes it's very rare that they want to be the first money in, and they'll kind of wait sometimes. So if you even get $30,000 and you blew it all, they're kind of looking on how you're going to now use their investment that they gave you if you couldn't even make anything happen with. 30. And can you mix um, invest? Because we haven't actually got um, any investors on this panel. These are strict grant donations, right? Mm -hmm. how, how does it work? Can you mix investors with nonprofit grants? Yeah, I think that's the that's the kind of investor's dream. Yeah, you know, investors take an equity piece of your film, which means that they're going to be taking, they they want to make their money back plus a premium, and usually that premium is probably one hundred and twenty five percent. So usually you have to pay them back first. So um, you know, if you if you kind of have a group of investors, it gets a little complicated because you have a lot of people who think they're equally as important, and usually the last money in the film is kind of the key money to get because that will enable you to. Finish your film and and you know have your sound mix and your the music composed. They want their money back first. So leveraging as many grants as you can to get your film made in this so with soft money. We don't ask for anything in return. Um, is 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 key, and I think you know that's the most appetizing thing to get kind of one of those equity investors. So about. if you have some some grant money, then they're much more likely to come. Oh, in absolutely, as yeah. And I think that's also kind of kisses it. You know that makes that makes the project a bit safer. Right. Yeah. Um, so just just to add in there, the um, with fiction for for Center Reach, we we give soft money grants to fiction films. Um, but there's a bit of a complication because we still require a fiscal sponsor, and a lot of fiscal sponsors will not accept a project that mixes equity um, and soft money. So it's a it's a little bit of a gray area, um, and I don't want to bore everyone discussing all those details here. But but it would be a conversation to be had if your project is mixing equity and can and you soft iron money. it out with a good lawyer? Yes. <laughs> Let's let me do funding like small budget films then mainly or yeah. narrative films. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean. Uh, 
to be clear, Cineritch will, will fund films. We really look at films with budgets of under a million dollars. I mean, that, that's the kind of scale. Anything too much higher than that, our, our $20,000 is not going to have much of an impact. Um, well, uh, along those lines, it's kind of a two-part practical question. First, uh, you prefer a director, especially a director, to come in with a short film that he can show you. Do you prefer it to be specific to the project that he wants to make? And the other part of that question is, um, having to do with what you were just talking about, does it carry any weight if there's some seed money in place already before we even come to you? For, I mean, yet yeah, definitely yes and yes. I mean, the, or well, rather, on the short film, it doesn't need to. Uh, the subject matter doesn't need to follow what your feature film is going to be about. It's just that you demonstrate that you have an ability to conceptualize and complete a film to and, tell a story. You know, and tell a story, and that that's what we're looking for. Um, how you do that? Um, how long it took you? Um, were you able to do that successfully? Get it onto the world, um, and then. What was the second part of your question? <laughs> if, if there's already seed money in place, oh, yeah, is yeah. that something you would even prefer? I don't know if we would prefer it. It's good to see that someone else has taken an interest in your project. It doesn't mean that just because you have it, we would then say we're going to fund it. It doesn't mean if you don't have it, we wouldn't fund it. But it's nice to see. And if you make, Cinereach has a two-stage application process, a letter of inquiry, and then we invite select applicants to submit full proposals. So in the full proposal, we'll ask you what sources of funding you have secured, what, what's pending, and it'll give us a sense of where you're at. And I echo that for Trebek All Access. We definitely, I mean, it helps to have some money, but it's not necessarily required. Because, um, you know, sometimes having the money shows the urgency of why you need our resources, you know, immediately, and why we should say yes um, to you. And then as far as the director sample, I agree. We just want to make sure you are a good storyteller and really understand and have a keen eye for story and telling it. Unless you're a first-time feature filmmaker working on a feature that or sort of have those red flags that, you know, an investor will look at, such as, you know, you're dealing with a really high concept explosions and or you're dealing with something that's like a child actor and you haven't really distributed I mean demonstrated that you know how to handle something like that but other than that it's really about just showing that you really understand storytelling and I'm very project specific um, I think the only time I want to look at previous work is if I'm granting you some money if you're in development it might not have enough of footage to show me the story or the character I'd like to just get a sense of your storytelling ability yeah, but you're in documentaries though right yes yes okay. oh you're not no, no narrative <laughs> so, um, apologies yeah, so shut yes, up we'll never be friends um, well I guess I, it actually begs one more question, what if there is talent, actual talent, known talent attached, before we come to you? It, I think that's a good thing. Um, one thing for narratives, um, we don't fund script writers with no director attached. So the fiction films that we have funded, the, the, the writer is also the director. Um, so we don't fund someone to just develop a screenplay so that they can then sell it to an agency. And you know that can help you or it can hurt you. I mean we definitely are going to judge the project on that. So if it's a you know 20 million dollar project and you have Steven Seagal starring in it, I mean of course we're going to judge that. But if it's not that, I mean of course I think having, act having talent actually attached to your project is a really really great thing because that speaks to the type of nuts and bolts that the industry when they meet with you are going to need when they go back and talk to their counterparts. Can you just pause back? Yeah. Uh, hey there. Um, I was wondering, first of all, if you could tell us uh, some success stories from like indie to like industry from each of you guys, like a director or a um, or the movie attached. But uh, second of all, particularly for Kickstarter, uh, intellectual property. Um, you know, anybody can go in and fund a project from Kickstarter. Anybody can look at it. How is my investment or my project uh, protected? And basically, particularly when it comes to distribution, how do you guys feel about that? Uh, it's not protected at all. Um, okay. No ideas are protected. It's up to the person to execute them. Uh, so that's certainly a risk you take. If you feel like your idea is so good, you know, you got that million dollar idea, then maybe we're not the place. But, you know, practically speaking, I think ideas aren't very valuable. It's more about whether or not you can do them. Um, uh, as for a, a case study, um, you know, what's interesting is that a lot of our products are made by 
people like you and me and whoever, just regular people pursuing a passion. You know, it, it could be someone who works in accounting by day, but secretly they're a great photographer and they have a Flickr page with, you know, 50,000 fans and, you know, they do something and no one at work knows. You know, it could be those kinds of things. Um, for film, there's a, a great film named Putty Hill uh, by this guy named Matt Porterfield. It's his second feature um, that has been very well received. Ebert gave it four stars recently. It's going to get a theatrical release. Um, there's a movie called Children of Invention that just opened recently that was a Kickstarter funded film. There's probably four or five films that are in theaters right now that came through Kickstarter at some point. You know, we didn't fully fund these things. Some of them were raising money for post-production. Some of them were raising money for marketing. You know, other ones probably just for, just promote the film itself. Um, but there's a really nice range whether you are seeking $500 or you're seeking, you know, $100,000. Um, the biggest project we've ever had was $200,000. That was four kids from NYU creating an open source Facebook Facebook. Um, that was kind of a lightning in a bottle moment. Uh, generally, we're pretty good up to projects up to about sixty thousand dollars, seventy thousand dollars. Any examples of films that have come through that you want to highlight through Tribeca All Access? Um, I forgot the question. I'm sorry. Oh, oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I've been at IMP all all day. I, know. I apologize. We both have, and we're both sort of looking at each other blankly. <laughs> like, <laughs> are there any examples of uh, of projects that stand out? Projects that have come through Tribeca Access that I, you'd like to highlight? Absolutely. I mean, Trojan of Invention is a project that he just mentioned that got um, some some support through equipment, through our um, alumni support that we gave to the project. Um, Enrica is probably one of our you know biggest sort of narrative success films. Um, Shireen Dobby came through the pro program um, in 07, um, met one of the funders there and got a, a huge chunk of her funding that way. Um, Entre Nose is another narrative project um, that actually uh, got came through the project uh, and the program. Ryan, Ryan helped produce that too. Yes, and Ryan, of course, came on and and produced. Um, so, you know, in addition to that, we have um, documentaries all the way from Planet B-Boy to Herb and Dorothy to even Monica and David that just won and then uh, Making the Boys. So we've had a lot of, lot of you know, sort of uh, signature films that have came through the program and some really great directors um, And as that well. does show how the dots get connected, you yes, know, like you're, you produced it, you financed it. It, it helps to go through these programs. Um, yeah, we have lots. Uh, we had, well, a film that just premiered at Toronto, a fiction film called Look Stranger by Ariel Javich, a first-time feature filmmaker. Um, we had a doc called October Country. We gave it a post-production grant a couple years ago. Um, a Small Act is another doc. We came in last year. It aired on HBO um, this summer. Um, Entre Nos, which you just mentioned, we, we came in on that. Um, there are lots. Yeah, the same. I mean, we've had, a, um, this past year, we've had two docs that have really kind of broken out. Um, the Oath, which we've got, we got theatrical distribution for after we gave it a grant, um, which just aired on POV the other night. And another film from the UK called Enemies of the People, which, whoa, that's so bad. <laughs> um, which, uh, likewise, just got uh, theatrical distribution and is, had a, has a broadcast deal. But I think, <clears throat> For us, I mean, I think it's an example of the little months of money. The first year of the Gucci Fund, we gave a film from Brazil made by a UK filmmaker about Brazilian um, uh, ballet dancers in, in the favela. It's a very small film. We gave it $5,000, but we were able to um, kind of get behind it in a, in a way that... Um, we introduced it to the programmers of the Tribeca Film Festival. While we're connected to the film festival, it certainly does not mean that because we fund you, you're going to get in. But we introduced it to them. The film got in and is played at nearly every festival around the world, has gotten a small theatrical release in the States, has gotten broadcast deals everywhere. And this is a really small, beautiful film, but that probably wouldn't have had a lot of eyeballs on it otherwise. And I think that's, you know, all of us, I think we can kind of claim victories like that. And also, just to, just to speak to your point about intellectual property because I think that is really interesting uh, an interesting point and it, and it, and it is uh, often a, uh, an issue now especially with you know people marketing themselves on the on the web that I think filmmakers do tend to sometimes play their cards a little too close to their chest when it comes to um, their film um, to the point where they won't even put the trailer online which I've never quite understood because you know it's 
uh, or if they do, they don't make it embeddable. And I think that, um, you know, especially when you get to a point where you have a trailer and your film's completed, um, to hold things back from the audience who are your greatest fans is crazy. Um, you want to give people the tools that they need to promote the stuff that they love. Um, and I, too often I just see people who, for example, will have a website where in order to download the high-res stills, which, by the way, you should always have, um, you have to have a, a, a sort of press login. Why would you want to hold, you know, high-res stills back from a blogger in, you know, um, Wisconsin? It just doesn't make any sense. So, you know, there are certain things, obviously, that you have to be careful with, and there's certain access problems, and, you, you know, you, you have to be strategic, but just be really careful about holding everything close to your chest, because at the end of the day, you, you want your film to get discovered. Um, right, where's the mic? Can you... Hello. Uh, I wonder if um, any of you can speak to how helpful a fiscal sponsorship is for a project. Um, I have a project and um, I just got accepted into a fiscal sponsorship. And I want to know if that's, if you've seen it be something that can make raising money easier or faster, or if it will maybe complicate things if you connect the filmmaker with, say, a traditional executive producer. Um, will they look at that kind of askance, or? I mean, for Cinereach, um, it, I guess it depends on your fiscal sponsor, but most organizations have a vetting process. You have to apply to receive fiscal sponsor from them. They have to make sure it's not a commercial project, yada, yada, yada. So in that sense, we know it's already been screened, and we have relationships with fiscal sponsors, so we know the, the people that run those programs, and we can always ask them about it, and that's always a good thing, because they're familiar with your project. Maybe they've met you before. Um, so it depends on the fiscal sponsor. I don't see that it could hurt your project. Um, it's just an another way for us to know, learn more about it. What does not a commercial project mean? Does that mean you can't make any money off it? Yeah, I mean, well, I mean, it's, um, I, I'm not a fiscal sponsor expert, but, um, you know, managing the grants program, we have encountered projects where they have investors and then they go to try to secure a fiscal sponsor and are told that they cannot, that they will not be accepted into that program because the project is deemed commercial. And so it's a, it's a bit of a gray area. Well, I just want to add what they explained recently in an orientation was that this fiscal sponsorship exists to create the property right. and then is dissolved yes. after the project is created. Yes. Mm -hmm. So they only, this was the New York State Foundation for the Arts oh, yeah. for anybody who's interested in, nice. in looking into that yeah. for their own project, that um, it just needs to be not for profit while you're making the film. Right. right. And then they dissolve it and you can try and sell it or distribute it however you want. Otherwise so. it would be a rubbish deal for all of us. <laughs> but I mean to keep in mind that each organization has its own sort of guidelines um, and ideas about the pro kind of projects they support. Women Make Movies has a fiscal sponsorship program. IFP has a fiscal, spon fiscal sponsorship program. NIFA does. I mean there, there are a lot of organizations that do that and each of them have different ideas about what kind of projects they want to support. And some of them are much more involved than others too, right? Yes. Some of them have some editorial and... Oh, and the, some of them editorial control. They all take fees. That's something to keep in mind. Um, so do your research. Make sure you, you know what you're getting into when you, when you apply and, and if it's a right fit for you. Can you pass it forward? Just wait for the Um, I have a fear about uh, raising uh, funds for a feature film in using this process. Um, let us assume that I have what I think is a, a unique uh, story to tell, a story that's never been told before. And I need a million dollars. I come to you and you say, all right, tell me what the film is all about. You give me $10,000. I go to the next person who gives me perhaps $25,000. As you say, sometimes it takes ages to make a film. By the time I've actually raised perhaps even half the money I need for the movie, everyone knows what my project is all about. And that uh, the uniqueness of my story, which I, 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 I reiterate has never been told before, is out in the open. How do I protect that? Timing. Um, because you came to us 
you know, when you had no money. Maybe if you're, you know, one of those people that want to be protected of your story, maybe you come to us when you have, you know, half of that or a quarter of it. So that the, you know, the $30,000 respectively that we're giving you is just pushing you that much further. But believe it or not, I mean, there is really, I mean, any story you tell, there's some way somehow you can say, you know, stems to some kind of idea. I mean, I think there's no really true way to protect a story in an idea. I mean, the same idea that you might have, someone else might make the movie. I think sometimes by being out there first can actually put you at a better pos position, um, especially when you're dealing with, say, maybe a documentary, that you have access to this subject, and you're actually going to be out there doing this story and telling, and it kind of sometimes puts you out there for people earlier to know that you're actually telling this story. So sometimes it can work to your advantage. Yeah, I mean, everyone is always telling the same story that you're going to tell, no matter what film you're doing. There's already there's somebody making the same film, or two or three other people making the same film, and, it, and it, that's just the way that it is. And when you say everyone knows about it, our bubble of funding is maybe that big, and you want us to know about it. Like, we have to know about it in order to give you money. Do you, you don't want the public to know about it, but trust me, they're not paying attention, so I, I, think, I think we're okay. You're okay. <laughs> All right, so I think what, what, what this gentleman said really earlier about uh, if you have seed money, is it going to help? Right. But at that time, the answer was no, it did not necessarily help. But I. But now I learn that it might help, right? Because, in fact, I do have seen money. I right, think it for this, helps. and um, and that's why I was very interested in uh, in his question. And uh, the point is, the seed money is about ten percent of what I need. And I don't want to talk about my movie to to a whole lot of people, right? I just want the ninety percent, right? And I'm, and I'm prepared to talk to two people. That's about it, right? I can't talk to everyone about it. So, is there a way that? Not even funders. But I can be helped. You can't talk to any funders. A, a big part. Like when you say you can't talk to anyone, I mean I understand that you don't want to, you know, put it on your blog. But do you mean you can't you can't come no, to no, funders? No, no, no. I I would talk to two or three people to raise the, the balance of the ninety percent. But but I don't want to sort of um, go online or or or, or sort of. Right. A blog well, or whatever. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. And, and what you also have to remember, you know, like Adela takes meetings for our projects. And the fact that we are, you know, a brand that's doing some sort of filtering for the industry. We're curating. We're saying we believe in this project. It means a lot to someone like her. When she comes to meet with our project and say, well, you know, if Trebekah is saying this is okay, not necessarily that it fits for her, but she's going to pay close attention because we, she understands that, you know, we're putting our name behind it. We did the due diligence of having an open call and making it fair for everyone, and then really saying to the industry, these are the one, and with our own track record and success we've had, really put our name out there and say, these are the projects we want to select. So whether it's the C money or just the association, it always means a lot to funders um, to see that you have that sort of association. And uh, always just to remember how small the industry is, the independent. I mean, it really is a really tiny industry, and everyone talks to everyone else, and the same goes for festivals. So just to always be aware of that. you know, People do, I mean, in a good way because that's what makes it supportive, but people do, everyone knows everyone else and everyone talks to everyone else. I, I just want to add, I, I don't mean to say that but having seed money is not helpful, it just, what I meant to say was that it doesn't make us less interested in your project. Um, the other thing is, if you're talking about a million dollar budget, it's highly unlikely that you're going to fill that million dollars with grants, with soft money, you're going to need investors. So talking to investors, I mean, I, I think that can only be a good thing um, because maybe they know other investors who might want to fund your film. Um, so, yeah, that's it. Thank you. Any other questions? Just behind you. Hi, can you pause? Yeah. Hi, for Kickstarter, um, do you ever get investors that participate to the movies? Like, do, do filmmakers on Kickstarter sell production credits? Um, you can sell production credit. You can't sell any sort of financial return or any sort of equity at all. Um, so, you know, if I give you money for your film, if I give you ten grand, I get to feel magnanimous, and you know, maybe a character is named after me, but I, I don't get any piece of the film. Um, we do that for a couple of reasons. One, uh, it would be against the law. Um, it's, it's a little reason. That's a little reason. Why, why is that? Uh, SEC uh, regulations about who an, an, uh, a qualified investor can be. That's the extent of, of, of why. Because no. you don't control who funds. You can't that, solicit investors. You just can't. You online. can't ask. You just can't ask for 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 equity. But but you know the other point is that uh, if you're looking for equity, you know if I'm looking at your project and I'm saying, do I think this is going to make money? You know, are are, are there going to be lunch boxes for this in three years? Then I'm looking at your project the same way that. 
you know, some executive at a major studio would, which is not thinking about the art or the craft or the sincerity or any of those things, but thinking solely in terms of the business, you know, the business possibilities. Um, and we think that's the wrong way to think about things. You know, we, we want people to judge things based on, you know, do I like this person? Do they remind me of my friend? Do I think they're cute? You know, all these other things that we as people actually respond to and the things that we respond to in art as well. So, yeah. And you can, no, I mean, interesting because in Europe, um, five years ago, I have um, created a production structure where a lot of people could take a small share into a movie or an installation, but it was done very friendly. You know, there was no platform involved, and so I'm wondering whether, you know, is there something like this online that allows um, a very fragmented investment participation into a film, but if you say that you can't solicit I, I'm not sure if there's a platform. I know there was a site called, I think it was called A Swarm of Angels. It was a, a UK site maybe five or six years ago that did something like this. They raised about 100 grand selling small pieces of equity. Um, so in, in Europe, the laws are different. Uh, but keep in mind that, you know, if I, like if you're selling equity in your, in your film, A, you're going to have a lot of paperwork to think about. Uh, and all those people, they're going to be waiting for royalty checks for 37 cents in two years, you know, and and I don't know how much value is, is there in that. You know, I think it's a good thing to ask yourself. Okay, thank you. Can you just pass it forward? Um, first, I, my close friend just got funded by Kickstarter awesome. a few days ago. It's, it works, it's magic. What was their project? Uh, Serena Yost, she's making a new CD. Musician. We like that project. <laughs> um, I wanted to ask the grant givers uh, again about the work samples. If you're a first time filmmaker, um, but you're um, more experienced in another medium, you know, can you give, I mean, does that help to reassure you to, can you back yourself up? If, if you don't have other footage to back you up what, from what medium, previous what film. What sort of medium are you talking about? Well, writing, or maybe if you're a photographer, I'm just. In this I mean, case, writing. But I, yeah, I think if you have the ability to think of an idea and then execute it um, and and promote it, um, that's always helpful. Mm -hmm. But um, in terms of funding film, if you're, I don't know if you're interested in doc or narrative, mm -hmm. and they're quite different in terms of the way we we look at those. But um, you know, if you don't have the experience to execute your idea, then you maybe can find someone who's more experienced than you and bring them on board, and that adds a lot of credibility. Okay. So maybe you haven't directed before, but you have a producer who's willing to help you, or you find a co-director. Mm -hmm. um, not to say that we wouldn't fund a first-time future filmmaker, but but those things help. Okay. And Thank and you. for to wreck all access on the narrative side, if you don't have a director attached, you actually still can apply, and we don't necessarily need to. See, we don't have to see any footage or anything. We're just judging your script as a whole. And we've had pro, uh, writers who've done that, directors who came in a program just as a writer trying to get an agent maybe out of you know participating and sold projects before out of it and then got funding for their next project to direct it so uh, we definitely if you want to comply without having to submit any footage as long as there's no director attached. Ryan do you Thank want you. to just talk a little bit briefly about um, what kind of footage you're looking for and like the, the difference between like a, a, a Hollywood trailer and a fundraising trailer because I think that that can be quite confusing wanting to see scenes play out. <laughs> yeah I mean I think I think um, you know we asked for to look at a minimum of seven minutes of footage for films that are in production or post-production. We do um, look at development stuff, but that's a different set of criteria, which is on our website, which we should tell you is TribecaFilmInstitute.org um, in both Tamir and my and our other programs that we have under the Institute are, are listed there. What we look for is, um, you know, we look for a variety of things. I, I think a trailer that is uh, specifically geared towards fundraising to make money for your project um, is very different from the trailer that would be used to sell or conjure up an audience for your film, I think. Um, you know, we look for an introduction to the characters and the story and also the issue or, you know, kind of what the heart of the film is about and um, kind of just a bit of movement so we can see where the story is going. We don't need to see where what the conclusion is, 
but where it's going. But that said, I think you know we look, for, we have, we need written materials as well. And in the written materials, we do want to see where the story is going. Even though your film's obviously a work in progress, I think being able to to articulate on paper what you think the conclusion of your film is, or how it's going to play out, and how you see all of the the bits kind of tied together at the end, really kind of just shows to me that you're a business person, that you're a smart storyteller, that you're a filmmaker, and that you you know how you want to kind of wrap up all the loose ends. So I think kind of, is, while footage is a visual medium, it is essential. Kind of having those written materials along with it is, is equally as important. Um, I think we're going to have to wrap up. Um, if you have questions, you might you can try and pound some people um, after the panel um, before they run away. Um, so I hope you're all feeling incredibly optimistic about uh, the future of film. Um, and if you're not, then just remember that the Europeans are in the same boat as we are now. <laughs> Thanks so much for coming.